Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our Facebook Live for today. And today is Thursday, and we are going to be doing them on Thursday at 12 o'clock. We tried 1 o'clock, we tried 12 o'clock, we tried uh, Thursdays and Fridays. And I think by popular demand, Thursday is where it's going to be, to the best of my ability. But remember that everything that we record, like this one, will be on Facebook the second we finish. You can watch it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We also put everything on YouTube, so you can watch it there as well. So that'll be great. I'm on nights this week, and I just realized I forgot to shave this morning. So I start at 5, but I come in at 7 a.m., so I got this to shave. Now, um, this week I want to speak about the Felix Project and just tell you a little bit of background, tell you what we're doing, and tell you where you can get more information about it. And people can ask questions, and I'll be happy to answer them. So. The Felix Project is a project where the goal is for the early detection of pancreatic cancer on CT. Now, all of you know, and many articles have been published, that up to 30% of pancreatic cancers are missed. Now, it's not when the patient says rule out pancreatic cancer, but it's a vague abdominal pain, just whatever reason the patient got a scan, and it's missed. Sometimes the tumors are too small, sometimes the duct is dilated, people don't appreciate it. But we know that less than 50, less than 20%, probably 15% of patients who present uh, are surgically resectable. If you could pick things up earlier, you would have many more patients who are resectable. And now with the newest chemotherapies and radiation and chemotherapy and really incredible surgery, we can cure more patients. And although we're looking for the cure for pancreatic cancer, looking for that magic bullet, the right medication, we're not there yet. But in the short term, this could be the most incredible thing. Pancreatic cancer, which has over 50,000 new cases a year in the U.S., and is growing in frequency, and has over 40,000 deaths, is now the third most deadly cancer. And with the cancers above it, breast and colon decreasing and survival increasing, pancreatic cancer in a couple of years may be the number one killer of Americans, and worldwide it's just a catastrophe. So we've started a project a few years ago almost two and a half years ago a little more than two and a half years ago actually spearheaded by Ver vogelstein and ken kinsler particularly Ver vogelstein probably the most famous researchers at hopkins and one of the most famous people in the world and we put together a team that really i think is doing is a great model for what you can do so you had the bert and ken which are in oncology and genetics but truly science is probably their, their field. They're just too broad. Uh, they just know too much about everything. And then computer science, so you had Alan Yuli and between five and 10 incredible graduate students who've been working on the project from Homewood. Uh, we have Ralph Rubin from pathology, who's head of pathology on his team. We have myself, Karen Horton, Linda Chu, Satomi Kawamoto from radiology, plus we have five and they have full-time people who just segment data. We have computer scientists working with us here, uh, Celine Park, Celine Park, and we are about to recruit a few more people. And all of us are working together to try to do this discovery. Now, of course, that takes money, it takes vision, and it takes someone willing to take a chance. And that chance was done by the Lust Garden Foundation. And Really quickly, you could look up the Lust Garden Foundation online, but it solely is involved with basically curing pancreatic cancer. And they were kind enough to support our work. Most of their work is basic science. We were the first AI project. If you look at the Lust Garden Foundation, the name, uh, the person who was the head of Madison Square Garden and died from pancreatic cancer, and that's how the foundation started. If you look online, just an incredible group of people, the Dolan family, who uh, really is basically cable vision in Madison Square Garden, uh, Ken, people like Kerry Kaplan who run the organization, um, just an incredible, incredible people. And I won't mention a whole lot of names because then I'll leave something off. But um, their vision and their focus, they, they don't support 20 diseases, which would be great. They invested over $160 million in the detection and cure of pancreatic cancer. So just a tremendous, uh, incredible thing. They're in Woodbury, New York. I was up there this past year presenting, trying to get our grant refunded. And it's just an incredible group of scientists and researchers. And they truly 
have put together in their core the best of the best and do a lot of research out there as well in Cold Harbor. So uh, we're most grateful for them because without their support, this would not be possible. Now, so what did we do? So if you said our goal is to detect pancreatic cancer, what's the steps that need to be done? What are the programs we need to develop? Now, I'm not going to say the program we have is look at Elliot, look at the CT more carefully and try to pick up tumors. I look really carefully. We teach on CT as us, everyone how to read pancreatic cancer, the subtle findings of a dilated duct, the subtle perfusion changes, the importance of dual phase imaging, the importance of 3D imaging. We've been doing that for a while and I think it's helpful, but it's not getting us where we need to go. We need a new step. We need to change the paradigm. And deep learning is the way to go. Artificial intelligence, deep learning. Now, everyone says, whatever you need to do, it's deep learning, it's artificial intelligence. But we started before everyone said that, quite honestly, but we are really focused. So what did we do? The first thing we did is try to teach the computer to read the scan. You're starting, the computers cannot read CT scans. So we spent one year, and because of Lust Garden, we had these people who could segment the scans. So we had four people segmenting each of the scans. And I don't want to segment just the pancreas. We segmented everything from vessels to organs, from diaphragm to pelvis. And then with that, Alan and his team were able to develop software and specific algorithms to be able to detect every organ with a very high degree of accuracy and be able to recognize the pancreas. The entire boundary of the pancreas, they could do it as well as I could, okay? So that was terrific. That was about a year. We used about 1,400 normal cases and then, then some. We were careful, we used renal donors to make certain that we had good data sets. Fast forward from there a year. Now you say, okay, we can recognize all the organs. Well, that's not the same thing as recognizing pancreatic cancer. Now we can't recognize big tumors, we gotta recognize the small tumors. We gotta recognize the things that people are going to miss. So over the next year, we developed new algorithms that took everything we learned about the normals and then taught it how to read a CT scan. How do you pick up those small tumors? How do you look at the ducts? How do you look at changes in caliber and changes in texture and mapping? And we spent a little more than a year doing that to the point that we're in the 90-ish, mid-90% 90 range for detecting pancreatic cancer. We also enhanced that. For example, Sion Park has been working on radiomics and random forest, and she could separate tumor from non-tumor, nearly 100%, 99%. Not only that, we could separate one of the most difficult things, autoimmune pancreatitis, from cancer, where the best person could do about 74%, the computer is about 98 or 99 percent and is perfect at doing that. So now we're saying we need to detect the tumors and we need to detect the tumors early. We need to look also at, it's not just adenocarcinoma. The Lust Garden is focused on adenocarcinoma for the most part and so are we. But if you have a computer program that's going to read the scans, it better read everything. So now for the last six months or so, we've been focusing on neuroendocrine tumors, particularly small neuroendocrine tumors, vascular, small, often a centimeter or less, and a different appearance. And we're developing new algorithms to do that. One of the guys yesterday from Homewood gave the most spectacular presentation. Think about using arterial and venous phase, not separately, but together, then, then teaching from those two data sets to create a super data set where you're able to pick up even the smallest of tumors. And this was because we meet every single week and discuss this, and when we see the failures, we then develop algorithms to learn from those failures. And what was presented yesterday was the most astounding thing I've seen because you were, you were at more than 85% on either arterial venous for picking up uh, neuroendocrine tumors substantially better than before particularly for smaller tumors. And in fact, you look back at things we looked at three weeks ago that we missed, now the computer was perfect at picking them up. So we are advancing on that level as well, and we're working really hard. The other thing looking backwards, of course, is if you have an algorithm that's good in neuroendocrine tumors, there may be parts of that algorithm that are very helpful in adenocarcinoma. This radiomics thing, this idea of being able to look at tissue and map, very critical. 
One of the reasons we're hiring two more people on that is because it has tremendous promise, not only for detecting pancreatic cancer, not only for distinguishing normal from abnormal, but cancer from uh, autoimmune pancreatitis, so you don't have patients going to surgery for no reason, but you can look at the data and predict survival. You can look at the data and predict response to chemotherapy. When you look at neuroendocrine tumors, you could potentially look at the data and figure out which tumors are going to be aggressive and you need to resect when they're small and which tumors will not be need to be resected that you can simply follow. So one of the things, of course, with discovery is it's not like Google Maps. You know, we didn't say, okay, we're starting here. We don't know anything. We're trying to get here, which is detection. And you make a right, you make a left, make a right, left. No, 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 no. We know where we're going or where we want to be. How we get there is not the most obvious path. We kind of know what we need to do, but this constantly changes in strategy. It's not just random craziness, but you need to be focusing on what you need to change. Steve Jobs made the point that when you look at going from A to B, in retrospect, it's very easy to point on the dots where they were going, but it's those dots that are only detectable or knowledgeable in retrospect. As you're going forward, you're trying the best we meet every Wednesday. Bert Vogelstein said we meet on Wednesdays. We meet at 2 o'clock. We don't meet every other week, every month. We meet every week. We present. It's like 2 to 3, very intense. And that's what's really driving the fact that I think we've had really good results. We are trying to use that idea about meeting every week. It seems like the world's simplest idea. But you know in academics, you meet a month, every month, every other month. When you get together, when it's a good time, there is no good time. 2 o'clock, there's no choice. You're there. You're ready, you're rocking. So we're doing that. I think that part's really, really good. Um, and so what we're seeing now is the ability to detect tumors. We're gonna go back, and we started way back with some cysts as well, just for looking at lesion detection. We're gonna analyze all the cysts, again, figuring out, um, can you distinguish the different cystic structures, which I think we can do, but then the differentiation between cysts and tumors, adenosia, neuroendocrine, and the like. Now, one could say, what would we like to end up with? Well, you can imagine you're scanning a patient, scanner's here, and you're here reading. Somewhere between you and the scanner, the, the data goes, the computer will find the lesion and say to you, hey, there's something here. Now, if it only said there's something there and didn't say it was adenocea or pancreatic neuroendocrine or cyst, that would be great. Just to tell you there's something abnormal, that would prevent you from missing things, and then you would have to think about it yourself. But the way we think about it and the way things are going, it's not just going to be say, hey, something's wrong there. We're going to tell you what's wrong. And then you're going to analyze what's wrong and tell the clinician. In the, air, in the era of AI, saying there's a mass there is not going to be enough to keep your job as a radiologist. You're going to have to provide actionable information to the referring clinician. And that's how we're looking when we, at the end of the day, that's where we need to end up. Now, in saying that, um, there's, there's a number of challenges. We're using cinematic rendering for looking at texture mapping. Can we integrate everything? Now, we've been developing multiple different algorithms. We've been looking at radiomics. We've been looking at cinematic rendering, looking at texture changes. Uh, we're doing all sorts of things. But now, over the next year or two, what we're going to do is take all of those parallel pathways and bring them together to form one superhighway. And the goal is to have all of your capabilities, all the information, all the knowledge put together and do it as one thing. And that really is the excitement. Now, in saying that, we are writing. So now if you go to, let me just tell you that uh, on CTSS, I've mentioned this maybe in the past, we've spent a lot of effort now building up an AI program. I want to call it AI for dummies, but I just said AI for radiologists. Yeah, that's a joke. It's AI for radiologists. And in there, there's sections. There's pearls where I read a lot of the articles and I put the key findings down. We put down the key articles that are being published inside radiology and outside radiology. We have what's called miscellaneous. If you look there, you can see a lot of the articles I read that we're seeing from whether it's Wired Magazine or JAMA or other places or Time Magazine or Fortune or Forbes. We have all this stuff there. So you can read about and what people are thinking. NVIDIA with Jensen Wang as CEO has allowed us to use all of their lectures. They have like 500 lectures. They, they record all of their meetings in, in high def. And 
I, 500 lectures was too much, and most of the stuff is like a lot of programming. I know for most radiologists, it's, not, it's over your head. So I took about 100 of the most important lectures, which are about apps and use and things we would understand. And if you go to that section of NVIDIA, you'll see that as well. We have a section now on the Felix Project. And when you go in there, you could see we have one thing that says Felix in the news. We've been on NPR. We've been mentioned in a number of magazine articles. So we put that in there, which is kind of obnoxious. But I figured, hey, we're obnoxious people. But then we have in there all of the articles we've published. Alan and his team, uh, and a lot of them are computer articles. You can post the full articles. Sometimes you can almost understand the articles. It's, but you can see what we're thinking about, what we're doing. And we're going to also keep posting articles. Then the Chu just got an article accepted on AI and the Felix Project uh, to JSCR today with needs some modifications. Suyun Park just got an article to Medical Image Analysis Pub accepted. Uh, uh, Satomi Kawamoto has an article that's being revised. Linda has an article that's an AJR. So we are going to put all that there. Now you can ask, what's this Felix Project? And in fact, you know, um, the only thing I know about Felix was Felix the cat. When I grew up, Felix the cat, you know, uh, Felix the cat, the wonderful, wonderful cat. Uh, I'll stop there. But um, Karen Horton said Felix. When we're looking for a name. When Bert Vogelstein said we need a name, Karen said Felix because her and her daughter are big Harry Potter fans. And it's Felix something or other, which is a potion that if you drink the potion, whatever you do comes out successful. I thought it was an eh name. Bert Vogelstein said it was incredible. So let it be said, so let it be written. So the Felix Project uh, is, is what we call it. And it's very exciting. Uh, I think we're looking at doing great things. I think it's important. You know, it's an important disease. Um, we can make a difference. I mean, Hopkins is very dedicated, whether it's surgery and pathology and radiology, immunotherapy and medical oncology and radiation therapy. We are trying everything we can to do better. And it is a challenge. We're not the only ones. There's many places doing wonderful things, whether it's the MD Andersons or the Sloan Ketterings or the Mass Generals or the Brighams or Stanford. I don't want to leave anybody out. But And then you have Emerson Collective, Reed Jobs, pushing uh, a lot of the research in this direction as well. So I think it's very exciting. It does make the point, and I think for those of you out there looking at research, it's the Lust Garden Foundation, people like that who have a vision who are willing to take a risk. We did not, we had not really worked together. We, whether it was Alan Yuley, who just came from UCLA, or Bert Vogelstein in oncology, or myself, we know each other, we met each other, but we never really worked on a project like this. It was Lust Garden that took our word that we would make it happen, and they've been very generous in supporting us and making all this possible. We have right now five full-time people segmenting. We need the data. Everyone writes articles about things, and they say, well, uh, we would do better if we had data. We have data. We have over 1,100 neuroendocrine tumors. We have 1,400 adenocarcinomas. We have 111 autoimmune pancreatitis. We have thousands of normals, and we are working hard on making that better. So if anyone has any questions, this probably is a great time to ask those questions. Um, as I said, if you go to CTS Us, Go to our deep learning. It's right on the front there. It's really terrific. We've been putting a lot of effort into building it. Anyone has any comments, suggestions? That'd be great. If you look in there, there's lectures and exhibits. And we have not linked everything perfectly, but those lectures and exhibits, at least two of the lectures, really focus on the, on the, the Felix Project, so you can get a lot more information, a lot more of the science. And... Uh, Two of the exhibits are the Felix Project as well. So we'll have everything linked closer in the near term. But we're very excited about things. I think hopefully uh, some of that excitement did come, come through in this talk. But I think it's really an opportunity. I think you know people talk about the best of times and worst of times. I think for discovery, it's challenging, but this is the best of times. I mean, the tools, the technology, uh, and we're very excited and hope that we can be part of making a difference. So with that, I'll thank everybody for their attention, and we'll see you next week. And let me just also say that tomorrow is Good Friday and then Easter Sunday. Tomorrow is also the first night of Passover, and Saturday is the second night of Passover. And we want to, thank, we want to wish all of our friends and family and everyone listening and everyone who is 
goes to see TSOs all year long, the happiest and healthiest holiday season for you and your family, and it may be terrific for everybody. So with that, see you next week. Bye-bye.